Welcome everybody to today's book at lunchtime. I'll announce that the book that we're going to be uh, hearing about is um, my colleague Professor Nick Perkins's The Gift of Narrative in Medieval England. But for those of you who don't know about book at lunchtime, uh, it's a veritable institution at Torch. Uh, it's one of our longest standing events. Um, and uh, every uh, book at lunchtime uh, event uh, is filmed and put on YouTube. So we have films of every book going back to 2013. Uh, book at lunchtime has a growing history and a heritage. And uh, we've been privileged to feature um, an astonishing variety of books and authors over the year. So today we welcome uh, Nicholas Perkins, Professor of Medieval Literature and Fellow of St Hugh's College to discuss um, one of his many books, um, The Gift of Narrative in Medieval England. Uh, this book places medieval narratives in dialogue with theories and practices of gift and, gift and exchange. And there have been some really marvellous reviews uh, of Nick's book, which I'm sure have, <laughs> have, have, have been very pleasing to him, I, I hope. Um, I would cite, I don't think I've ever had a review like this in my life, so I'll cite these. Um, this remarkable study, a brilliant response to Derrida's injunction that we try to think the gift. Nicholas Perkins's book is itself a gift in which the elusive phenomenon of the gifted object has found its ideal, answering intelligence, lucidly scrupulous, attuned as much to the book as a, as, uh, a gift to the gift in books and ready to draw as much an anthropology as on the material of the history of the book. Like all gifts, it's radiant. Um, and one of the marvellous things that's come out of this project, I think, is the Gifts and Books exhibition, uh, which Nick uh, curated um, in the Western Library in Oxford, which ran from June until October. Uh, and today uh, he will discuss the opportunities that the exhibition gave uh, to engage a broad audience with his research. And I'd also like briefly to introduce um, uh, uh, our panel. Joining Pro uh, Nick Perkins today is Professor Helen Swift, uh, Medieval French Studies, Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages, um, and Dr Lucy Brooks, Fitzjames Research Fellow, Medieval in English Language and Literature. Um, so uh, I've had the privilege of working with Helen. Um, actually, we, we co-supervised um, an MST dissertation, uh, which is really an interesting thing to do. Um, and um, she has been teaching and researching medieval French literature for almost 20 years at St Hilda's College. Uh, subjectivity. Uh, yeah, it's not long, Helen. I mean, you know, you're, you're a newcomer. I mean, my goodness, you know. Anyway, subjectivity, narrative point of view and identity construction uh, are key concerns in her study of 15th century fictional narratives uh, in verse and prose. Um, she's currently working on guide figures, yes, in late medieval narrative poetry and how they inflect our thinking about the activity of guidance in the academy today. So that's a really interesting thing. Um, and Lucy uh, is a literary scholar who specialises in the secular literature written in England during the high to late uh, Middle Ages. So these are expert hands, basically, to conduct this discussion. Uh, I'll hand over to Helen, who is our chair for the panel today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a particular pleasure, with particular pleasure and gratitude, that I welcome you to today's book at lunchtime. And I'll come back to that particular pleasure um, in a minute. Um, I want to say very few words of preamble um, as chair. Um, what I want to do is just say those few words, say a little bit more about our two speakers. Um, they will then speak, and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion between ourselves. And then, so as not to be selfish, we will then open that out um, for your questions and discussion before rounding off in the usual schedule by two o'clock. So in this wonderful book, The Gift of Narrative in Medieval England, Nick thinks expansively about the term gift to explore gift giving, exchange and storytelling in Middle English romance. He constructs a dialogue between these medieval narratives and various conceptual models of gift, object and exchange in critical theory and anthropology. What he uncovers through this dialogue are powerful insights into social relations, how people and things are valued and circulated 
in ways that undo boundaries between human and non-human entities, and the speculative potential of romance narrative as a genre. Important questions emerge about literary economy, obligations and promises, and the status of storytelling itself as a form of gift giving. The book came out originally in 2021, not a time when we were well set for gathering together to celebrate, um, but was published in paperback earlier this year, which gives us a happy further occasion for gathering together to celebrate its success today. I said that it's with particular pleasure that I'm contributing to today's event, um, and that's because of the happy alignment in Nick of the topic that he explores as a researcher and the values that he practices as an academic within and beyond the university. I've had the joy of collaborating with Nick on various medieval scholarly endeavours for the past 15 years or so, um, and most recently working with him on issues of equality and diversity in the institution, how we create a more inclusive culture, how we embrace doing things differently. Generosity and reciprocity are key to how Nick goes about his professional life. To offer but one small illustration that also shows the gift circling back to the giver, Nick and I devised, ever such a long time ago, um, the first Medieval Studies at Oxford website hub that developed through various other hands, through various sponsorship, into the wonderful Torch Medieval Studies programme that we now have, through whose website today's event is advertised. More broadly, reflecting on the energies of the gift and its generative movement has brought me to consider how we might fruitfully conceive or reconceive of the economy of academic community relations in relation to gift exchange, given it's an interaction of humans and things that promotes interaction and circulation, that has positive surplus and unpredictability, that turns away from reckoning immediate value. The ability of the gift, as Nick reminds us, to create long-term bonds between people returning in unexpected ways. Our itineraries as researchers, teachers and colleagues can be enriched and expanded, opened up to more equitable and inclusive cultural imagining, redefining the value and trajectories of persons and things. So let us in that regard not underestimate the power of the gift. So to our two speakers, um, Nick's initial training was in early medieval literature and culture, and he's moved in his career between that and late medieval texts and their readers, as well as always having an interest in post-medieval uses of the medieval. One connecting thread is that some of his previous work, for example, on the poet, melancholic and scribe Thomas Hockleave, was about how medieval authors thought of the value and exchangeability of books and language, and that's something that's there in the gift of narrative. He's going to continue, he says, to work for a bit on texts and exchange, on objects in stories and as stories, and on how storytelling is received, especially inside medieval narrative, medieval romance narrative, and what that might tell us about how romance narrative itself might have value. Lucy's research thus far has been focused on characters and selves in medieval English romance. Her doctoral research and first book considers the relationship between narrative, storytelling conventions and textual subjectivity. She also works on the history of emotions and has published an Arthurian literature in England. Her interest in storytelling has also generated a second strand of research and her next project is broadly about truth, asking in what ways is romance a vehicle for different kinds of truth? How was truth understood in the high to late Middle Ages? And what roles do the concepts of history, veracity and authenticity play in our sense of what makes a good story? So I hand over to Nick. Great, thank you so much, um, Helen, for that really generous um, introduction. And it's, it's a huge pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, because everyone's really busy. Thank you also uh, for coming um, at this time, that's brilliant. So um, I, I know that it's hard to uh, encapsulate and talk about the whole of, a, of an academic book in the short time that we have available. And I'm not uh, rosy tinted enough to think that you've all actually read the book. Um, so what I'm gonna do um, in the time that I've got is to introduce some of the kind of key ideas and sort of things that, that I was asking uh, when I was writing the book. I'm going to do that partly actually by reading aloud from, from some of it in a slightly old fashioned uh, way, but I think it sort of, it can uh, work as well to give you some sense of, of the tone of it. And I'll summarise a little bit more 
Um, and then I will, if there's time, I will talk a little bit about a couple of projects that came out from writing uh, this book. So in a sense, um, this book here is, to some extent, a traditional you know, academic uh, monograph. Um, but some of the other projects that I've done as a result of it have been you know, much less traditional. They've been much more public facing, people would say, and they've led to other forms of kind of creative work. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And there, there are things that have come out of the project in ways that I wouldn't have thought of or expected to happen, a little bit like what Helen was saying about how anthropologists and other sort of dangerous theorists describe uh, gift giving um, and actually sort of f folk tales and so on as a way that you might give something without thinking and then much later on you get something back that you didn't expect that might not actually be something that you really wanted at the time uh, but that has transformed and, and changed and, you, and often grown um, it, over that period. So I first <clears throat> started thinking about some of these ideas um, I think it was probably in about 2002, something like that. Um, I was teaching at Girton College in Cambridge um, and I was teaching a special option to my uh, final year students, which was about courts and courtliness. And we were looking at a number of different medieval texts in different languages there. And there was one particular text that I sort of got to really enjoy teaching and talking to my students about, uh, which is called The Romance of Horn. Um, it's written in French, uh, what's now often called French of England or Anglo-Norman uh, French. It's a really major, uh, complex, brilliant uh, poem. And there's a whole load of giving and receiving and taking and exchanging and moving around and objects and people sort of circulating in that narrative. And I think that was the first thing that got me thinking about this. At the time, my boss at Girton College um, was the great... Uh, scholar anthropologist uh, Marilyn Strathern, uh, Professor Dame Marilyn Strathern, um, who had written a big book called The Gender of the Gift, amongst other sort of work in, in anthropology. But at the time I was kind of very naive and I happened to be sitting next to Marilyn at lunch one day, as you do in, in Goethe, and I said, oh Marilyn, you know, you're an anthropologist and you know, I'm just starting to think about gift giving in exchange. You know, is there anything that you can recommend that I read about that? It's one of the things that, <laughs> that colleges enable you to do, to talk to people in other fields. And that's what we always say is, is good about, you know, sometimes going to lunch in your college. And she very graciously said, well, you know, yes, there may be one or two things that I can recommend. We had, you know, a good conversation. She lent me some books. Um, and so, in a sense, Marilyn and her work and her ideas were a kind of, you know, starting point or guiding muse or something. And there were a number of people, other people at Girton, including in medieval studies, for example, Professor Sarah Kay, uh, who's sort of written in this area as well and who I had really um, valuable conversations with too. So what I'm going to do now is to read out from the beginning of the book which sort of sets out the stall if you like for why these things might be interesting or important. So in order to do that I'm just going to move slides. Um, okay here we go. <clears throat> and I also this is slightly this is also kind of show and tell as well so as I read I'm going to show you something here too. Um, So this is from the beginning of the introduction um, to the book. And it's quite unusual for me. I'm normally quite nervous about writing, as it were, a more personal thing in an academic uh, book. Some years ago, my mother, uh, when I'm speaking, I'm just going to say my mum, but I didn't quite feel I could write that uh, in, in the first sentence of my academic book. My mum gave me a flattish black box. It was leather covered, like an old book, with an embossed gold line framing a hinged lid secured by a spring push button. Nestling in the box was a set of six silver spoons, a bit bigger than teaspoons. So you can probably see them here, um, but they're also pictured um, just there. They were delicately patterned at the handle. I knew these spoons. In my childhood, they'd been in a drawer with things that were kept for best. You know, sort of when auntie so-and-so came over on Boxing Day or whatever, we might, you know, use these but they were a pain to wash up afterwards. Um, they were a pleasure to you, so I didn't write all of that, sorry, that's my like, little... <laughs> <laughs> they were a pleasure to use, fitting comfortably into the hand and the mouth. Along with the spoons, my mum wrote me a note about them. They'd been a wedding present to her in 1964 from an elderly lady, someone we referred to as Old Miss Sprake, the sister of a man in whose small law firm in Lancashire my grandfather's father had worked his way up from being a clerk to partner. 
along with her notes, my mother included um, the letter uh, that Miss Sprake had written to accompany the spoons while declining the wedding invitation. The letter's addressed to my grandfather, so the bride's mother. Uh, the invitations had been sent out by the bride's parents, as was customary, and Miss Brake was invited as an important connection, though she barely knew my mother. Miss Sprake was an old lady in 1964 and had not been well. In her letter, she tells my grandfather that the spoons were made by the firm of McFarlane in Glasgow in 1842, though these details I don't think are quite borne out by the hallmarks, but I'm not an expert. She notes that they are unused and somewhat archly expresses the hope that, quote, your daughter likes some old fashioned things, a topic perhaps on the mind of a Victorian lady who'd lived through two world wars uh, contemplating the young generation of the 1960s. Perhaps the Spoons had themselves been a present to Miss Sprague at a much earlier point in her life, but this is pure speculation. And I, in my imagination, and I don't know this, I haven't discussed it, and perhaps some relative will say this is totally untrue, but in my imagination, she's a kind of Miss Havisham figure, and that these Spoons were perhaps, you know, a present to her, but then, you know, the engagement was called off, and. You know, she's kept these unused spoons hanging around for all of those years, you know, for 60 years or something until, you know, giving them, uh, in which case, you know, there is a novel to be, to be written about them. <clears throat> but that's probably totally untrue. Um, yeah. In her own note to me, uh, my mum jokes that uh, I might be interested in the, the, their provenance because of my research on gifts. Uh, I sometimes use the spoons when I have family or friends over. Their monetary value is not great but they're beautiful and well-designed. More than that, they carry with them a set of connections and a story, one that's sometimes retold when they're used. Many families have objects with equivalent stories, often far more dramatic or romantic than this. I keep the two letters from Miss Sprague to my grandfather and from my mum to me uh, in the box. Perhaps one day I will give the spoons to one of my children and include another note. Uh, they haven't discussed yet which of them I ought to give them to. Um, these spoons are a small example of how gifts connect people, often renewing or complicating those connections over many years and generations. Gifts both represent and embody mutual obligations. So by which I mean a gift both describes an obligation, but it also can be an obligation in itself. It's both things at the same time. In this case, between families who are linked professionally, but for whom these relations extended into a social and personal sphere, particularly at significant events such as a wedding. They tell a story about changing perceptions of duty and gendered roles over the last hundred and more years. They can establish, uh, gifts generally can establish both generosity and hierarchy, or in some circumstances, threat. The energy they bring to interpersonal relations is not used up in the moment of their being given, but it's stored and then renewed at certain key moments in their continuing journey or in acts of conservation within a family or community. In the words of Margaret Atwood, quote, every time a gift is given, it is enlivened and regenerated through the new spiritual life it engenders, both in the giver and in the receiver. Gifts themselves have a trajectory that can be traced and told. They provoke explanation and reflection. In other words, they give rise to stories. We could say that they materialise narratives, sometimes through their form, history and human connections, sometimes in readable signs, such as the Glasgow assay marks on my spoons and the accompanying letters. Many of these attributes of gifts we implicitly understand and are attuned to subtly adjusting our habits and expectations depending on whom we're with, where we travel, and what our own circumstances are, even if we don't know or care about the ways in which anthropologists and other theorists might describe um, those habits. So that's the way that I begin the book, working from a really particular example. And I think it's, it was important to me that I chose an actual object that was a gift to start with, but then to think about how that object does provoke us to think about telling stories. And I think, I don't know whether you would sort of think this in your own experience as well, but very often it is one of the most important things about a gift 
is not necessarily it in itself. It's about what we then say about it, how it nurtures a relationship between people, the way that we then remember that moment, but we could also kind of come back to it. And often, of course, it's a kind of staging post or a marker of particular moments of our lives. Now, <clears throat> medieval romances, those kind of, broadly speaking, kind of fictional adventure stories that might be set in a mythical past, um, say the Arthurian past or the classical period or some other kind of misty moment, um, they are also really interested in all of those things. They're interested in interpersonal relationships. They're interested in exchange. They're interested in marking certain moments of lives and then assessing and reflecting um, on those. Um, and they also um, mingle sometimes or think about how people, persons, were, uh, are, are connected in a similar kinds of ways to objects. And sometimes the person and the object in a narrative actually get mingled up um, together. And in a minute I'm going to talk about a very quick example of that in a particular Middle English um, text. So just very briefly, and I won't spend more than like a few seconds um, on each of these, but just very briefly to say how the book is then made and, and, and structured. Um, it's got five different chapters. The first chapter sort of sets out some of this, um, some of this sort of ideas material from anthropology about gift giving. But one of the key things that it that it thinks about is a central problem in uh, debate around gift giving, which is like, how do you start to give a gift? Like, where does it come from? And on the one hand, gifts apparently should be generous and spontaneous. On the other hand, we all know that they are linked into a much wider circle uh, of giving and receiving. And, and so there's been a lot of thought and sometimes a lot of skepticism about the concept of a gift itself. Can there ever really be a true gift if gifts are always bound up with social um, relations and they always kind of expect a return? So there are different ways of managing that problem. Um, and I talk about that in narrative as, as well. And in particular, I like to read some of the texts that I talk about um, there as being, as, as a, a protagonist, a hero in a romance, also being a kind of gift and how they get started and how, so how stories start is one of the things that we can use anthropology um, for. Uh, in chapter two, I'm talking more about actual objects that are given and received in medieval romances. And the group of romances I mostly use for that chapter are ones in a big book of uh, English text, which is called the Auchinleck Manuscript. Um, it's in Edinburgh. It was produced in probably in the 1330s um, in London, and it's got a number of romances and other kinds of texts um, in it. And I also talk a bit about another more, more well-known Middle English poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is all about exchange. Chapters three and four um, are about Chaucer. Uh, and chapter three is really about exchanging prisoners and women in certain, in sort of like uh, military uh, and classical scenarios. So Chaucer's Knight's Tale and Troilus and Crusade. And so a lot of anthropology and theory revolves partly around gender and giving, the concept of, say, women being, quotes, given in marriage, which, of course, in, 19, in the 1960s, uh, when my mum was married, it was still very much like part of the expected sort of scenario. And if you think about the traditional words of the, of the Church of England kind of wedding service, you know, the father of the bride gets up and the priest says, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? And that's, you know, that's the, when the father of the bride says, I do, and has to kind of hand her over. So that symbolism is very much still kind of embedded um, in all sorts of, uh, in all kinds of societies uh, uh, across the world. So exchange of prisoners and women. Uh, chapter four is a little bit different. It's sort of more about verbal exchange and a promise as a form of gift that says, in the future, you'll get something back. I promise that I will do this for you in the future. And how that plays out in Chaucer is quite um, important. And then finally, there's a chapter which is about a particular book that probably was a gift book, but it also has a narrative with loads of different gifts and exchange in. It's a narrative, it's a poem called The Troy Book uh, by the 15th century writer John Lydgate, who was a sort of younger, uh, sort of in the generation after Chaucer. And of course, the story of Troy is a story of gifts, especially gifts gone wrong, um, like the Trojan horse, uh, for example. So that's the kind of scope uh, of the book as a whole. 
So I'm just going to give a very quick example uh, of, of one of the, of the, of the texts uh, and then sort of just like introduce some of the things that I've done um, with it and then move on. So here's an example from one of the texts I talk about um, in chapters one and two, King Horn. So it's a version or a, um, it's influenced by that big French book uh, poem that I talked about before, The Romance of Horn. It's a version of that. And here we've got an actual protagonist who's called Horn. And at the mo a really crucial moment in the story where he's been exiled he's, and he comes back to rescue the woman that he loves who's about to be married off to someone else. He's disguised as a pilgrim in, in most of the accounts and he turns up at the wedding feast and he asks for a drink. And it's her job as the bride to carry round drinks to the, to the guests. So she offers him some, uh, have this cup. She thinks he's just like a greedy, um, you know, sort of hanger on. Um, Horn, though, refuses that particular cup. He says, um, Quen so dearer, dearest queen. I don't want wine, much or little, except from, in the Middle English there, a, a cup of wheat, which most people think means they're a horn. Um, you think I'm a beggar, but I'm a fisherman. I've come to fish at your feast. And there's a whole metaphor that engages that. Then he says, I shan't drink from that bowl, that dish. Uh, drink to horn from a horn. So here he's punning on his own name and like mingling himself with the object. He's like a gift that's kind of gone off elsewhere and has come back again. And later on um, in the story, just after this, he drops into the horn, the drinking horn, a ring that she has given him as a gift. She later on, she discovers, she sees the ring uh, in the wine vessel and she realises that he somehow must have come back or something about him is there. She still hasn't recognised him, which is one of the things that medieval romances, of course, can do. Um, but there's something about the way in which at this particular moment, Horn as a character, protagonist, the horn as an object, the way in which the horn and the ring symbolise their their love, their relationship and the, and the way in which they've come back together and also the way in which he kind of is narrating the story from within the story are all really important to this uh, moment. So a lot of people think that Middle English romances are a bit dull and a bit sort of bland in a way, they just tell the story, but actually there's loads of uh, reflection and lots of sort of layering in this particular moment of, uh, of this story. The idea of him as a fisherman is something that um, is really interesting there as well. So that's just a tiny little example of how thinking about the person as an object and an object as a person, thinking about gifts and exchange can kind of come back um, together uh, again. So um, I want to sort of um, get on to the other things. So I'm just going to very briefly sh like show you some of the other things that, that came out of this. So um, as um, Christine was saying earlier, um, so, or for example, that's a horn from this period. Um, we can talk, we can go back and talk about this, but this was an example of an object that we managed to include in our exhibition, Gifts and Books, which spread right across um, time, really. But um, the horn was a really important symbol for all sorts of things in this period. So people listening to that story would have really recognised that. Here's that horn in our exhibition uh, with the manuscript of, of King Horn next to it. And here's an example of a, a project that came out, a knowledge exchange project um, funded by Torch here that came out of this, working with young people and elderly hospital patients, thinking about some of the stories in the exhibition, including King Horn. And you can actually see some telltale horns and rings that are kind of here in the artwork um, that they were producing and some quotations from King Horn there as well. Quite, this is one of the things that are quite unusual to have a quotation for a relatively obscure Middle English text popping up in this work that the, the uh, patients and uh, students were, were, were doing. Again, we can come back and think about that later if we want to. And finally, another project which was connected to the exhibition with some primary school children in Oxford who, who we worked with, they came to the exhibition and then wrote some material uh, about it. So here's just one kind of creative response to the horn, which I really like. So this is from a year five student. Africa is my homeland, so the Horn of Wolf was originally an elephant on an elephant in Africa. I've travelled the seven seas. I'm an object of awe and fear, life and death, war and peace. I'm a gift, a present from afar. Um, I know what I am. I think that probably you ought to read I know what I am, but I think anyway, and I don't regret it. 
I know that every time I sound, millions are killed at my blade. So really powerful kind of riddle-like text that this 10-year-old student has written, having seen the horn in the, in the exhibition there. And I love the way in this picture we've got a lamp that illuminates it, we've got the horn on its stand and the little caption. I'm particularly pleased with that because obviously I had to write all the captions yeah. for the exhibition, so I'm, I'm particularly pleased about that. Great, that's all I want to say now and um, I'll get the, the, your PowerPoint up, shall I, Lucy? Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and then, yeah, Lucy, over to you whenever you're ready. Great, so um, I'm really pleased to be participating in this today, purely selfishly, I suppose, because um, Nick's book does really important things for my specific area of interest, medieval romance, as well as lots of other things for the field um, at large, more generally. Um, and, and in my own research, I think about character and subjectivity and selfhood in relation to conventional medieval genres. And as Nick alluded to, there is a sense sometimes that selfhood and convention are kind of at odds with one another. I seek to demonstrate that that's not necessarily the case. Um, so the section of the book that I'm responding to today comes um, at the end of chapter two, and it's a reading of the 13th century, the late 13th century romance, Amis and Amelon. And it really addresses questions of selfhood and truth. So it's one of my favorite texts. Um, and at various points in the book, Nick suggests that protagonists may act as gifts to narrative, as, as you've just told us. And towards the end of the introduction, this is where this comes from, this quotation, um, you write that the book explores a network of messages in romance suggesting how generosity, though always at interplay with dynamics of power and conflict, may open the self to the other, whether within established groups or across divides of rank, belief and gender, and how a turn away from generosity may have short-term benefits but will also close ethical, social and narrative possibilities. I'm really struck by the idea here um, and elsewhere in the book of the sharing of the self, the revealing of selfhood or subjectivity to another person as an act of giving a gift. Um, and that strikes me as a really productive way to read romance, which is a genre that I think is fundamentally interested in different ways of revealing and obscuring the self. Um, and that balance is certainly negotiated in Amis and Amelon. I'm going to provide like a very brief summary um, of the, the romance, as with so many of these things, they are long and complicated. Um, but Amis and Amelon are the sons of neighbouring barons, and they're born on the same day, and they're absolutely identical in every single way. Their parents can't even tell them apart. And they're also the best of friends and they swear an oath of, a, a, they plight their troth to each other or they swear a, a kind of oath of trouther um, to one another, becoming blood brothers essentially. Uh, when Amelon's parents die, he returns to his homelands, but not until he has ordered a pair of gold cups to be made and he gifts one of them to his brother Amis. Amis is then coerced into a relationship with Bellisant, rejects the friendship of a steward and has to prove his innocence in a fight. He asks his brother Amelon to take his place and the two swap households and wives even. Um, and then after a warning from a heavenly voice, um, they learn that this trick will be punished by leprosy, but they go ahead. Amelon defeats the opponent. They then return to their own lands. Amis has two children. Amelon is struck by the leprosy, which disfigures him so severely that he becomes unrecognisable to anybody. And in fact, the only way that Amis can tell him apart from other lepers is by the gift of the cups. Um, an angel then appears and tells the brothers that Amis can cure Amelon by anointing him with the blood of his children. So he cuts their throats and kills his children. Amelon becomes whole again, and then miraculously the children are restored to life. So it's a happy ending. Um, and then the romance ends with the brothers living out their days happily together. They're perfectly the same once more, and they die on the same day, and they're buried in the same grave. So it's a lovely, happy romance ending. Um, it might not surprise you that quite a lot of this, the modern scholarship about this romance ends up getting really caught up in that shocking aspect of the infanticide. And I'd suggest that the only way really to make sense of this moment is to follow the rules that the romance sets out very carefully, really to the letter, to accept in a sense how great a gift Amelon is to his brother 
Amis and to the narrative more generally, he's a gift in two senses. Um, and, and elsewhere, I've explored the poet's very careful use of superlatives and comparatives when kind of establishing different hierarchies of, of value and importance in the text. Um, and the gift of the cups is really central to this. The cups themselves become necessary to the recognition of the, the leprous and therefore temporarily different Amelon. The cups are described as both full alike, neither as less or more. And that's actually that less or more formula is also used in relation to the brothers. So it's, um, it's a pointed uh, repetition, I think. Um, the point is that neither Amos or Amelon can be less or more as well. The hagiographic tenor, that kind of saintly tenor to the text, um, may also offer an explanation for that incomparability that the, you cannot tell them apart. Because um, if they're considered saintly or divine, a kind of shift has to occur in the medieval Christian imagination because they, they no longer have to be subject to the constant comparisons that exist in the world, the shades of grey of post-lapsarian experience. Um, where there's either perfection in unity with God or not um, best or not best, essentially, in the kind of romance formulation. Um, Amos and Amalon are fundamentally in the romance better than everyone else, and so they need only answer to each other. And this becomes very clear in the scene of the infanticide when Amos is sort of contemplating whether he should kill his brother, uh, kill his um, children, or, or subject his brother to this terrible fate or his friend. Um, and so we have superlatives and comparatives really jostling together, revealing ultimately that one choice to Amos is the more terrible. So although for his children, him was full woe, for ne'er and ne'er non born, well loath him was his children to slow, and well loath are his brother forego, that is so kind a corn, that is so highly born. So Amos may be loath to kill his children, but he is well loather to subject his brother to a life of leprosy. He's loather because Amelon is irreplaceable and thus not subject to the direct comparatives that apply to the rest of the text. The love between the brothers, the friends, is a sort of perfect gift and all other relationships are in a sense reduced to disposable object. Um, borne out as, as Amos explains that Jesu, when it is his will, may send me children more. <laughs> The moral validity of that decision is then compounded by his wife's um, total acquiescence upon discovering um, the death of her children. She says, God may send us more children, of them have no care. Um, which again has struck various critics as, as pretty unrealistically callous um, or evidence of a kind of deviance which is hinted at earlier in the text. I think it's actually deeply misogynistic to kind of read a moment when character is so clearly subordinated to narrative structure as evidence for her um, perceived cruelty. Because if we consider the, uh, this as an extension of the narrative logic of the poem, her pragmatism is the only correct response to the event. The children are not Amelon, and Amelon is the best. Um, and that's a, a sentiment that's echoed throughout other romance narratives as well. Um, my favourite is perhaps in Mallory's Mort Arthur, the great um, 15th century Arthurian Arthuriad, um, where once the infidelity of Guinevere and Lancelot has been exposed and the court begins to disintegrate, Arthur famously states that he is far sorrier for my good knight's loss than for the loss of my fair queen. For queens I might have enough, but such a fellowship of good knights shall never be together in no company. The lack of specificity is the important thing here. He speaks of queens, not Guinevere. Amis and Bellasont um, refer to children, not to individuals. These are categories and roles that are replaceable in a way that the superlative best, the, 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 the protagonist is not. The protagonist in the romance is the only real romance role that just cannot be done without. And, but in the Amis and Amelon story, I suppose it has kind of been split. And the result is that all other characters and character types are just sort of expendable. Just like the love between um, Amis and Amelon, the, the glory of the round table in the Arthurian story, which is a collective, the like of which the world has never seen, is a generative gift to um, romance, creating story and plot and action. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you immensely to um, Nick and Lucy. Um,
and we'll open it out to discussion very shortly. Um, I shall now just take my um, opportunity um, to throw a couple of questions into the mix um, in response to the tremendously stimulating stuff you were both saying. Um, and um, one of the things emerging, I suppose, quite obviously from what you were saying was a, or as part of what you were saying, um, is a, a defense of the interest of um, romance narrative. And I'm wondering if in thinking about the importance of thinking about gift in romance narrative, what the, how you would think about the specificity of that. So in other words, what, what, it, what is it something specific to the fact that we're dealing with verse narrative, but then also there are prose romances, so perhaps not, or is it something that's more narrative rather than lyric, but then there are other kinds of narrative. So in terms of how you might think about the, um, the specificity of how gifts are working in romances, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I can start with something like that. I mean, I think I always, I don't usually like it when I read other people's work and they say, oh, this idea is really specific to this genre and it kind of only works in here and I've unlocked this idea. So I not, I don't want to make a claim that it's only in romance or that there's some magic thing about a romance that makes it because something else I've sort of written a little bit about is actually how porous are the, boundaries if there are any boundaries uh, around genre generally but romance you know in, in particular but I think some of the things that romance does or romances often do it's about a kind of cluster of claims and ideas that the genre sort of provides so they they're saying to the reader don't worry too much about the specifics of all of this you know you're in you're in our hands now as storytellers and just go just go with this uh, they're also saying w that there's there's going to be a kind of arc of narrative which very often comes back round again. Uh, this is something I sort of remember sort of debating quite recently. So when one of my teachers, lecturers, uh, when I was a student, um, was uh, James Simpson, who's just retired from being professor at Harvard, and he he used to give a lecture about romance, which says, "Oh, romance is really straightforward. It's <laughs> it's integration." disintegration, reintegration. And that is basically what romances are. And you could argue that a lot of narrative is, but they really strips down the kind of whole process. So that's where a gift, which starts in one place and then comes back round again, could be particularly telling. But I think also a lot of romances, I don't know what you think, Lucy, a lot of romances are also just, they are texts which want to provide pleasure as well. I want to link in, albeit that they're in set, set in these fantasy realms, they want to also link in specific objects and the kind of feel and texture of people's lives into it. So beautiful gold cups, you know, uh, that are, a pair of them that are that link people together or um, in the Romance of Horn, um, um, Rigmel, the, 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 the lover of Horn in the French version, she ends up sort of sending masses of different gifts to the sort of um, steward guy to kind of bring Horn to her. And there's this whole catalog of different things that she's like greyhounds and horses and jewels and all of this kind of stuff. And it's like, you imagine him kind of like weighed down with all this material, like he needs one of those great big Ikea bags to put it all in and sort of go off with. So all of that is happening, but it, that is not necessarily, so, so a lot of people in the past have regarded that as being sort of, uh, showing that romances are not um, sort of to be regarded on the same level as like great literature but actually that's all part of their aesthetic as well. Yeah absolutely I mean that kind of thing is often just reduced to like a catalogue so there are lots of romance lists of, of stuff and so there has been really interesting work so far I think on just like the object material things in in romances and that is important but what's nice about the idea of a gift is that it instills a level of agency behind it's not just that this object exists uh, it, it there was a choice to gift it there was a choice to retain it and and that and all the story and all the kind of narrative that is generated around that thing so um i think it's a, an interesting complication of yeah the, uh, uh, an observation that is very often has been very often used to kind of reduce um the genre in the past I think there's one other thing sort of coming from that that, that it makes me think that I do talk about a bit in the book as well, which is a kind of further idea about gift giving and romance narrative is that storytelling itself is a gift 
and inside romances you often have people who, you know, they might be totally unknown and then they say, oh, I'm going to tell you a story about myself. And that, in a sense, is a kind of gift that opens up these relationships with, with other people. And so an object as a gift is kind of like a story that's also a, a gift. And so there's a kind of relationship between those as well. Yeah. I've got a ton of other questions that I could ask, but I want to open it out to, um, to everybody here. Um, do you feel free to give a name or say anything about yourself as you ask your question, but don't at all feel obliged to do so, whatever you're comfortable with? Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's a really, and, and so go in in the Green Knight, you know, is a poem which is, is both does all the kinds of things that romances normally do, but it's also incredibly knowing about the tradition that it's using and and sort of quite quite sort of um, uh, what's the word reflective on that as well. So you pro most of you probably know the sort of basics of that story. It's a so-called um, um, exchange of winnings kind of story. Uh, and it involves going, uh, someone bursts into the Arthurian court, this huge monstrous green knight. He asks someone to cut his head off and in a year's time he'll return the blow. And Gawain sort of steps up and says he'll do that, cuts the green knight's head off and the green knight sort of lollops around and picks up his head and the head speaks and says, right, see you in a year and goes out. So then Gawain, he, he has to set out to find the green knight. He uh, gets taken in by this um, uh, very... Um, genial host Sir Bertilac and they, they agree to exchange their winnings for the next few days. Bertilac goes out hunting, brings back the quarry that he's got in his hunt. The winnings that Gawain gets are each day Bertilac's wife tries to seduce him and the first day he gets one kiss, second day two kisses, third day three kisses and so on and he has to exchange those with Bertilac so he has to then kiss Bertilac in the, just the right way, you know, in this kind of loving way. And in amongst that, of course, he's worried about being killed um, by the granite. And so at the sort of at a crucial moment, the Bertilac's wife, she's not named in the poem, she offers him a number of things, actually. I mean, she offers him a great big ring. And it, in my view, this is kind of a real kind of like, for people who like know about gift giving in romances, they're like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, this is going to kind of come round somehow. It's going to be important. But Gawain actually says, no, 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 I'm not going to have the ring. And that's almost like a moment where both he and us as listeners to the poem relax a bit and we say, oh, he's not taking the ring. But, and, and then she kind of slips in this idea of this girdle, this kind of belt instead. And she says, oh, why don't you have this instead? And it doesn't look like much, but it's got this magical property. It will protect the wearer. So in a sense, Gawain is a really important moment, isn't it? Because he's both, he's making a gift exchange with her. But in the kind of hierarchy, including the sort of gendered stakes that this castle has, he, she, she, he doesn't have a right to do that and she doesn't really have a right to do that. So you kind of, in these circumstances, you need to be able to and have the authority to make a gift. So he, he sort of accepts it and he says um, if he um, could have slipped to be unslain, the slecht would be noble. Like if he could escape with his life afterwards, this would be a noble stratagem or a cunning trick or something. And we know from that that he's kind of trying to be sneaky about it. He conceals the girdle and then later on, uh, I won't spoil the ending for you if you haven't read it, but later on it becomes important. So it is really important. The poet knows that it's, the girdle's really important, but it's also a really ambivalent symbol of giving and exchange and taking. And Gawain later on in the poem, of course, wears the girdle and reinterprets it not as a symbol of truth and Lucy, you know, you're interested in truth and there's loads of trough and trough. Uh, loads of undergraduate essays have been written on trough in Gawain and the Green Knight. He reinterprets it not as a symbol of truth, but a symbol of untruth or circuitry. So gifts can also then, there's sometimes like a, a bit of a debate or a struggle over the meaning of a gift. And that's a really important way in which a lot of medieval texts sort of draw this out as well. Essentially, you know, a little bit like in, Alice in Wonderland is that it's like it, what a thing means is what the person in power says it means or you could challenge the meaning of something um, through a way of describing it or a way of opening up to someone else who shouldn't perhaps have access to it so I think that's all part of the idea in going in the green light absolutely there are there are examples and that idea of words or poetry or a book as a gift 
in particular in a broadly speaking kind of courtly environment. Um, <clears throat> that's really important through, through this time and into the early modern period um, as well. So, <clears throat> for example, here on the front cover of the book is a kind of representation of a poet presenting their book to a king. And so that idea and, and, and that, there, that there's kind of advice or, you know, um, learned material or something that's valuable that's contained in, in the book. So there's a real interplay between especially books as physical objects that are valuable in themselves um, in the late medieval um, period. So the book as an object, that is also a gift. Um, and then the relationship between that and then the, the language in it. And many poets, of course, poets, what do you know? You know, poets think that poetry is valuable. <laughs> and so, but they also have a bit of a struggle. You know, they, they want to make sure that everyone else accepts that and uh, sort of works with that. So you get this kind of rhetoric. So in the late Middle Ages, you get this sort of rhetoric of excess almost in the, in the language of, of, of writing. So people have written about that in the slightly later period and called it co-PR, you know, this sort of almost like classical idea of like the, the abundance of language. But we, we get it earlier on um, as well. So partly the rhetoric of writing to your patron, you know, you want to show that language has value and, and so on as well. But a lot of the stories that these people are telling also include moments when advice um, language is also directly valuable um, to people. There are examples where, you know, princes, kings, whatever, as it were, might commission a book of advice in order to then sort of be able to give out copies to other people or show themselves to be willing to accept advice. But, you know, there's a kind of very symbiotic, you know, relationship um, between that, you know, definitely. Yeah. Good. I mean, and on my end, I mean, this is a kind of this has been the central kind of question of my of my research so far so I, I will try and keep it very brief um, but your sense of um, tradition and um, individuality sort of being able to work together I agree with that but that's certainly not taken for granted by a lot of the historiography about the middle ages I mean older historiography luckily but in, in England or in, in Western Europe, really. There is a sense that, that we had the 12th century Renaissance and then we had the Renaissance proper. And these were moments where the self could kind of flourish in new ways. Um, and this sort of 400 years, 300 years in the middle, it's kind of all a bit murky and muddy and, and, and repetitive. And I, I'd resist the idea that you can't have, we, you know, individuality or subjectivity is sort of reserved for geniuses like Chaucer, like shining moments. Um, I would suggest that it does, structure actually on a kind of narrative level lots of conventional narratives as well largely based on something that nick said earlier about the fact that you can take certain things for granted in a romance because they are so intertextual and they are drawing on each other so often so a single phrase um nicola mcdonald who i worked with during my masters always used to say to us almost every seminar that 14th century readers of romance were so much better than we are at encountering these texts that you will never be as good as a 14th century reader because a single line a single phrase or formula will evoke countless other examples of how someone felt or would have reacted or responded in this moment so i'm, I'm in my work i'm very interested in uncovering the resonance of a line um usually through emotion, something like, therefore she was full woe. And you have quite a lot of these moments in romance where um, a figure will be woeful or angry um, at quite in a, inappropriate times, really. And so, but, and, but the line is there and the line is conventional, but it will be repeated across different versions, different manuscript recensions. Often other rhymes will be changed, you know, according to dialect to retain this, this moment of emotion. And so I think by um, situating that convention within its wider um, context of convention, you can start to um, tease out moments of selfhood. But it's, it's long and complicated and um, that was f fairly vague. Um, I'm afraid we must now be appropriately woeful um, as we must draw things to a close. Um, but thank you so much for bringing your energy and your questions and your appreciation. But thank you above all to Nick and to Lucy for this wonderful panel today. Thank you. Thank you.